I don't know how I can follow up on those two presentations really. So let's see. So there are some advantages to going last, but certainly some disadvantages. So as I say, I'm uh, Joanne Greenhouse and I'm going to talk to you today about a realist synthesis that we um, have recently finished. Uh, and again, it was uh, funded by uh, the National Institute of Health Research. So I have to acknowledge their contribution and the same as Jeff say that everything I say is my views and not the views of, of NIHR. Our protocol is was published a couple of years ago the full report which which is 400 pages long um, is going to be published in December but we hope there will be much shorter and nicer papers for you to read but there is a first look summary that you can find on the NIHR website which is an executive summary of our findings so I'm going to try and follow up on some of the themes that both Nick and, and Jeff have introduced. Again, more acknowledgements of the, of the huge, wonderful team that we had uh, working on it. Um, so I guess what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, is to provide a quick overview of what really synthesis is, some of the methodology, um, and also to talk you through an illustrated an example of how we use really synthesis <coughs> to test program theory. Um, and hopefully to, as I say, illustrate some of those issues that, that Nick and and Jeff have talked about, that is the interplay of theory and evidence, the importance of context in shaping mechanisms and outcomes, and also the idea of transferable mechanisms, which I hope will come out from this. So what is really synthesis? So really synthesis in a way is a um, second, uh, is a, a equivalent in some respects to uh, realist evaluation because it follows the same logic. But instead of testing your theories by gathering empirical data that you go out and collect yourself, you do it through looking at already published literature and evaluations. So as both Nick and Jeff have said, it's focused on the realist question of trying to explore what works for whom in what circumstances circumstances rather than does this intervention work. So it assumes, it takes for granted, that interventions are not universally successful, that they don't work in the same way everywhere, but what we're trying to do is understand what works for whom in what circumstances. And so therefore the, the shift is a little bit different from traditional style systematic reviews and I think looking back when Ray first developed realist synthesis it was almost like as a response to uh, the traditional method of conducting systematic reviews which are based on a logic of aggregation. So it's the idea that you look at how many positive studies there are, how many negative studies saying this works and you sort of add them up and produce an overall average effect. So what Ray was trying to do is, is, is shift the dialogue, shift the question to asking a different kind of question. And, and here, so the unit of analysis of realist synthesis is the program theory. So those ideas that Nick was talking about, that the program theory that Jeff was talking about, that, that was tested empirically in a realist evaluation, in realist synthesis, it's tested by looking at the literature at already published evaluations. But it's different because the unit of analysis is not the intervention, it's the program theory. So it's the underlying <laughs> ideas and assumptions about how this intervention is supposed Supposed to work. So often when policymakers, clinicians, anybody thinks up uh, a new intervention, they think, okay, there's a problem here and this problem is caused by X, Y, and Z. So therefore, if I produce this intervention, it's going to solve this intervention in, in, in this way. So a program theory can be expressed as hypotheses to be tested. So it's an idea that in this situation, the program works in this way and produces these outcomes. So in a way, that's a shorthand for a CMO configuration. In this context, the intervention may work through these mechanisms and produce these outcomes. So it's a hypothesis around how context might shape the mechanisms through which an intervention works and produces particular outcomes. Um, and also, unlike traditional systematic reviews, which tend to focus on one type of evidence, so Cochrane style reviews tend to focus on quantitative evidence, other qualitative style studies just focus on qualitative, really synthesis is multi-method, it's a mixed method. It uses different forms of evidence, quantitative and qualitative, and it uses those forms of evidence to make sense of each other. However, the hard slog still remains. I don't know if any of you have ever done a systematic review or anything. You will know that it involves reading lots of papers. Really, synthesis is the same in that respect. It involves reading lots of papers. So in terms of just providing an overview of the technical sequence, I've gone for linear, which is unlike De Nick and Jeff, who produced these lovely, I blame Ray, this is one of Ray's slides. Um, it, it, it is actually much more 
iterative than this. Although it's presented as a linear, it's not. It's go, you go back and forth between the steps. So the first step, uh, as, as both Nick and Jeff have alluded to, is you uh, focus time on producing some program theories to be tested. This is a bit like being in a swamp. It takes a long time. It, you know, I think we were in this state for about six months at least, and you, you're always discovering new ones. Um, you then ha have to focus down on your program theories and think, OK, these are the ones that I'm going to test. This is what I'm going to look at in my, in my study. And then there's a different phase of searching. So you have one initial phase of searching, which is around trying to identify the program theories. And the kind of evidence that you're looking at there, or the data you're looking at, is very different. So program theories often aren't explicit in empirical studies, believe it or not. Uh, you might get a whisper or a glimpse of them in the introduction and the discussion. But often program theories, these ideas about how interventions are supposed to work, are more often found in letters, in editorials, in discussion pieces, sometimes in reviews, all the, you know, in blogs, on websites, comments, you know, the letter section of the BMJ commenting on studies are a great way of finding, you know, and, and I know Nick, um, Ray wrote this brilliant paper about how, you know, listening to Radio 4 sometimes is a great source of trying to understand programme theories. So that's your understanding of programme theories. And then there's a, a focus on uh, looking at the empirical evidence, now, there's a search to identify empirical studies which is around testing your programme theories. Uh, there's, there's still um, data extraction, so you, you look at the programme, the, the, select the studies that you want to look at, but this is not along traditional lines of a hierarchy of evidence. It's about, will this study enable me to test my theory or not? Is it relevant to that theory? Can I trust the claims that that study is, gonna, is making about the, my programme theory? And sometimes it's just a small bit of that study. It's not the whole study, it's a small bit of the study. Um, there's a process of data extraction and then there's synthesis of theory, refinement and dissemination. I won't go into that in too much detail, but hopefully the, um, there's lots of places where you can read about this, this obviously. The, um, Ray's written a whole book about it and there's also a short journal paper. But what I want to do is try and illustrate how we applied that to a particular issue. So the, the, what I want to talk about is how we applied it to the use of patient reported outcome measures. Now I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of what a patient reported outcome measure. How many of you heard of a patient reported? A few people. Okay, essentially, patient-reported outcome measures are questionnaires that patients can fill in or people can fill in that ask them about their health. Um, so they're standard, often they're standardised questionnaires, tick boxes, questionnaires that you fill in. They ask you questions like, you know, um, are you able to put on your socks? Uh, has your health or illness interfered with your ability to go about your daily activities? There are many different kinds of problems. Some of them are individualised. So instead of having a standard set of questions, they are delivered as an interview and they enable patients to select areas that are important to them. Um, and these have been developed largely for use in research, but over the last, uh, I guess, sort of 20 years, there's been increasing interest in, in, you know, we develop all these measures, but what's the point? How are we going to use them? So there are, they are used both as a way of trying to improve the care of individual patients, but increasingly they are also used at an aggregate level as an indicator of the quality of care. So there's kind of two separate different program theories around the use of Proms. The talk I'm going to talk about today is mostly on how they might be used to help the care of individual patients. However, you will see that issues around how they're used at an aggregate level also influence that because it's quite interesting. The uses have, have often have developed in parallel but quite separate, but actually they become quite mixed up as I hope you'll, you'll see. So we, we developed our, our ideas about our programme theories about you know, how, how might uh, patient reported outcome measures using these measures actually help uh, doctors, clinicians to improve the care of patients and develop a a program three. So this was our basic initial program three, and it's a bit um, busy, but I'll try and talk you through it. So the idea is that the patient, before they go and see the doctor, they complete a patient reported outcome measure. That information is fed back to the clinician. The clinician reviews that information and, and realizes that the patient has got problems with depression or with um, walking about or with activity. So the underlying assumption, the initial underlying assumption of the problem is that clinicians aren't very good at spotting when patients have a problem. So the idea is that these, if you can 
patients complete a prom, it will help the doctor realise that the patient's got a problem and that they will, will raise that issue with the patient. Another programme theory is that actually these, these measures, partly it's about patients feeling that they haven't got permission to talk about things. So the process of completing this measure enables patients to reflect on their feelings, what's important to them, and then raise those issues with the patient in the cons with the clinician in the consultation. Um, I'm going to talk about that theory really and how we refined that and thought about it in, in the context of our review. So our this is our sort of initial theory and I have to say that I've borrowed this diagram from um, Sonia Dolkin. It's not at the bottom uh, but I'm verbally going to acknowledge Sonia um, and she wrote a, a paper trying to understand the concept of mechanisms uh, which was published in Implementation Science last year. So it's this idea that we've got this resource and we had, like Jeff, we had a number of, uh, Jeff's example, we had a number or a laundry list if you like of possible contexts that might shape how this intervention might work. So we hypothesise that it might depend on the structure of the PROM, so whether it's a standardised measure or an individualised measure. We thought that it might actually depend on the nature of the patient-clinician relationship because obviously if the idea is that doctors aren't very good or clinicians aren't very good at spotting patients' problems, actually if it's, if it's um, in the context of an existing relationship, the doctor might know about those already. They might, they might, or, you know, there's no way that it could possibly improve it. And we also thought actually it might depend on um, the use of of different ways that this PROMS data might be used. So in some services, so particularly in uh, mental health <laughs> services, the PROMS data is collected with the intention of helping clinicians um, support and identify problems for individual patients, but also that data is then aggregated up as an indicator of service quality. So if you go on to my NHS, uh, you can find out the um, ratings of all these measures for your local mental health services. It's all out there. Um, so the data is also used in that way as an indicator of service quality. Um, and similarly in, in England, in general practice, um, GPs were incentivised under the quality and outcomes framework to use uh, standardised depression questionnaires to screen their patients for depression. So if they didn't use the... the, the um, Jeff will be able to tell you all about this from a GP's perspective, <laughs> the PHQ note. If they didn't use a standardised measure to screen their patients, they lost some money. They, they, didn't, they didn't gain the money. So they had to use it. So there were two indicators. They had to use it initially when the patient came to see them and also two weeks up uh, fo uh, to follow on. So we, we wondered that, we, we wondered that, thought that would quite be interesting. So the, the mechanism that we thought might go on was, was focused really on patients, actually. And, and we, we didn't really hypothesise much about how clinicians would react, but actually you'll see when we refined our theory, we talked a lot more about how clinicians respond to this. Uh, you know, we thought the idea that, well, you know, completing the prom enables patients to reflect on their, on their um, circumstances, it forces them to think about their own health and, and enables them to say, actually, you know, I want to raise that with the doctor when I go and see them. So that, that was the outcome. So the way that we tested this was to try and almost set hypotheses about different um, settings as representing different contextual configurations. And I suppose what was interesting here with our review is that context doesn't come in neat little packages. So it wasn't like we found studies where we had uh, particular single contextual configurations. Um, we, to some extent, our review was governed by the nature of the evidence out there. So there was, we found that when we looked at the evidence, there was clusters of studies. There were quite a few studies looking at the use of PROMs in, in mental health and in primary care. There were a lot of studies looking at the use of PROMs in secondary mental health care, largely because of the uh, improving access to psychological therapies in children and adolescents and in adult services. And there was also lots of studies looking at, at PROMs in, in, primary, in palliative care. So we tried to hypothesise, actually, well, what do those settings represent? What differences in contextual configurations do they represent? And how does this relate to our original programme theory? So we talked very much about try to understand the nature of the relationship and, and in a sense these were hypotheses that were there to be tested. We weren't saying this is definitely how it is. Uh, we were saying well actually you know maybe these rep represent these things. So you can you, you so in terms of the nature of the relationship we thought that in mental health uh, primary care with people usually have an ongoing relationship with their GP but not always. It, it absolutely depends on on the way that the um, 
uh, the, the practice is structured. Um, in secondary mental health we hypothesis actually it could be new, so for new referrals who don't have an existing relationship, but also there could be people who, who uh, are, come to the system again. And in palliative care we hypothesise that this was probably a, an instance where the, it, you know, we were largely looking at people uh, who were forming new relationships so hadn't been referred to the service before. Uh, we also found studies that looked at the use of most of the studies in mental health uh, primary care were about stand, the use of standardised measures. In secondary men, mental health, we, there, there were some looking at individualised and some looking at standardised, and in palliative care, there were both. <laughs> and in terms of the use of the other incentives, in mental, in, as I say, in primary care, they were in, they were, there was other incentives to use the data under the COAF, and also the data was... Um, aggregated up as an indicator of service quality. In secondary mental health care, it was also aggregated up as an indicator of service quality, but there were no financial incentives at the moment attached to that. There wasn't a, an equivalent COF scheme. In palliative care, the, the measures were purely used largely to, to help individual patients. There wasn't um, a formal, although it, it's perfectly possible that individual places might have uh, used them as service quality, but there wasn't a government-backed mandated scheme whereby these measures were aggregated up as an indicator of service quality. So our initial hypotheses are said in terms of context, would it would depend on the structure of the PROM, the relationship, the point of the relationship building process and, and clinicians' existing experiences. So what we found that actually across these contexts there were a number of things that were actually similar. So one of the similarities was that in both mental health care, in primary mental health care, secondary mental health care and palliative care, patients and clinicians felt that sharing concerns depended on a trusting relationship. So as you see some of these quotes from the studies we found, uh, both patients and, and GPs talk about the importance of needing a, a trusting relationship to share anything. So you know this, this idea that it builds over time. And also we found that in terms of all of these contexts that clinicians actually preferred to, to develop those relationships through letting patients talk verbally about their problems. Um, and this gave, often gave them the sort of nuances that they couldn't necessarily pick up unless they listen to the patient. So it's the ways that they use the words, the ways that they express those things. So you, you, know, you can't beat someone you feel confidence in, you feel comfortable, no amount of bits of paper is going to change that. So these were uh, uh, similar issues. Um, and also a similar issue also uh, arising in, many, in, the, in all these contexts was that um, clinicians felt that standardised PROMs actually interfered with this relationship building process because they constrained this process, either because they seemed to trivialise their emotions or because they focused on... Um, actually promoted a very mechanistic way of, of assessing patients. So these are, again, qualitative studies um, saying, you know, if you've had it, you know, the patient's just pulled their heart out to you saying they're very depressed and they're unhappy, and then you ask them to fill in a questionnaire. Uh, it, you know, it makes it sound like you haven't listened to them. Um, and, and GPs talk very much about the idea, you know, how, how, where do I fit this into the consultation? How do, I, how do I manage? Where do I put this? You know, someone's just dropped this bombshell about I'm really depressed, and then, and then you know, similar idea, where do I... Where, do I ask them to fill in a question, uh, you know, questionnaire? It's just, they just felt it was very inappropriate because it sort of interfered with the flow of the conversation. So consequently, how did clinicians respond to this? What, what was their response to that? And interestingly, in, in palliative care, where they had a choice about whether they could use them or not, they avoided using them altogether. They just, just didn't use them. Oh, sorry, you know, I think there was an interesting study um, by Hughes et al, where I think they had real trouble recruiting anybody to, to be involved in the study. And the people that they did recruit, hardly anybody handed out the proms to, to palliative care patients. They just didn't use them. Um, in other studies, where they were looking at their use at first assessments in palliative care, they adapted how they use them. So they use them at the end of the consultation when they'd already built up this relationship with patients and where they could fit them in easily. Um, but interestingly, in, in general practice, there were also in, in, instances where they actually changed the items of the questionnaires in order to try and um, fit the uh, administration of the questionnaires into practice routines. And any of you who know anything about psychometrics know that changing the items in a questionnaire that's got all these quantitative assessments of validity and reliability, despite the fact it probably helps the questionnaire become more meaningful, it's an absolute no-no. 
because what it does is it invalidates the questionnaire. It means that it may not meet all these statistical tests of, of validity. So it means that it may not be uh, an, a, a good measure of depression or a good measure of, of the outcome that you're trying to, to measure anyway. And then interestingly, a slight change in context when financial incentives were used. So in the circumstances where there was the, the quality and outcomes framework in general practice, um, clinicians also engaged in what we might call gaming. So <laughs> in order to avoid losing the quaff points, because they didn't want to use the questionnaires, but if they didn't use them, they would lose their quaff points. How do, you, how do you manage that? So what they did was that they stopped coding people as having depression. So if you don't code somebody is de having depressed, that means they don't find themselves into the quaff points, so therefore you don't lose the points if you don't lose the questionnaires. Mm -hmm. so, so there was a kind of unintended consequences that actually, um, you know, measure the, the, the sort of estimates of, of prevalence of depression actually artificially went down. I'm not sure how big an impact it may have had, Jeff can tell you, but, um, you know, the qualitative evidence suggests that they avoided t coding people as depression so they wouldn't have to use the measures and so they, they avoided using the losing the, the money. Whereas when you, we looked at the evidence around individualised PROMs, these are uh, PROMs that are not standardised in the sense of they're not a questionnaire, but they're, they're, there's two issues that are different. One, they're often administered as an interview, so they are like a conversation. And secondly, they enable patients to specify what's important to them. So, not surprisingly, the clinicians, it, certainly in palliative care and, and sort of counselling services, like these PROMs because they replicated almost the way that they already tried to assess patients um, in terms of building that relationship they let the patient tell their story so they so they were much more positive around using them uh, they acted as a conversation opener interestingly though they were less good at measuring change over time because the issues that were important to patients changed over time clinicians were a bit confused about how they use these measures to monitor people over the time so good as an assessment but less good at monitoring change over time so to go back to our original program theories uh, and, and our little diagrams, how did we try and make sense of all these things? So how did we turn our laundry list, if you like, of context and hypotheses into some sort of CMO configuration? So, and I'm still working on this, so I'd be very happy for people to pick it apart. This is work in progress. You know how it is, you finish the report and then you think, oh, actually, that's really interesting. You reflect more on it. So hopefully by the time we write a paper on this, it will be brilliant. But at the moment, I think it's still work in progress. So we, we hypothesise that actually the standardised problem completion in a context where actually clinicians do prefer to, to um, develop rapport verbally, but they're asked to use the standardised problem, but they're not mandated to do it. So there's not, they're not forced to do it. They've got a choice. What do they do? They avoid it because they don't want to upset patients. They just, just don't engage with it. And therefore, the patient has no opportunity to use the prom in the way in which it was intended. I'm sure that they still have opportunities to raise issues, but the prom doesn't act the resource offered by the prom is not acted on in that way. People don't use the resource as people hope, hope it will be to raise those issues. A slight change in context, um, when clinicians are mandated, so they, it's again similar context in the sense that they prefer to develop rapport verbally, but they're actually mandated to collect the PROM and they lose money if they don't, as in the primary care example, they either adapted the PROM to fit into the consultation by changing the items and possibly invalidating the measure, um, or they gained and they avoided coding people as, with depression so in order to avoid losing the income. So the resulting was that the PROM itself may well be invalid as a measure of depression because they've changed the items, um, but also the prevalence of depression may, may actually be underreported. In terms of the individualised measures, uh, the clinicians again prefer to, to develop rapport uh, verbally and they can choose uh, to use a, a, an individualised measure or not. And that, that these indiv because they replicated how clinicians carried out their assessments anyway, uh, they, they enable patients to tell their story. They were very similar to the way that clinicians carried out their assessments. And, and so clinicians used them and they did enable patients to, to tell their story. So I guess 
to summarise, really, really synthesis is a progress, as, as, as Nick talked about. It's one example of a way of bringing theory to bear on evidence. It's a process of refining theories, but also that context is complex. Um, it's not about institutional settings, but it's about the sets of relationships, norms, cultures that exist within those settings. So it really does shape how, how people respond to interventions. Um, and also, the, the, as, as, as Jeff mentioned, these understanding of the mechanisms are transferable. Now, for those of you who are familiar with with the use of financial in incentives in other settings know that the idea of gaming is, is something that's found not just in this situation but also in other instances so in other there are lots of other studies looking at um, NHS targets um, and uh, incentivized um, performance measures which was what we looked at in, in the other bit of our review and we found very similar instances of people gaming to hit the target but you know missing the point so there we go. That's my end of my talk. Thank you very much.